It's Brucey Fumi here and I'm about to embark on the most exciting trip that I've ever done for Scotland History Tours. You see, Promote Shetland have commissioned me to make some videos about history in Shetland and some of the things that I've discovered have blown my mind. So, today I'm heading there to experience it for myself and I'm taking you with me. So if you're interested in the people, places and events in Scottish history, then click the subscribe button at the bottom right of the screen. In the meantime, let's ride this roller coaster as I tell you a story. Now, I've been to Shetland before to visit my sister when she did a stint there as a junior doctor and again during her Up Hell yeah, that festival of Viking boat burning and all night drinking and guys and stuff. So, Whilst I wasn't entirely ignorant of Shetland and its uniqueness straddling that world of Norse and Scots, I knew that I hadn't even scratched the surface. But from what I've learned from a wee bit of reading and chatting to experts, under that big hairy Viking beard lies the crusty chin of a geyser jarl that needs scratching. Let me know if you've ever been to Shetland. So, Shetland. 500 islands, islets or rocky outcrops of various sizes straddling the North Atlantic and the North Sea. 16 of the islands are inhabited, although seldom by trees, because it's the windiest place in the British Isles. But conditions in Shetland mean that it's got some of the best preserved evidence of early settlement anywhere in the British Isles. And it has more pre-Iron Age house ruins per acre than anywhere in Europe. All right, thanks very much. So where do we start with Shetland history? I suppose we start right here where we land. It was when they were extending the runway for Sunbury Airport that they discovered some of the oldest artefacts found in Shetland. A stone burial kist from 3200 BC. So there were folks burying loved ones here over 5,000 years ago. And the pottery in the grave tells us that they were in contact with folks in the Hebrides at the same time. Now, just over that way, there's an incredible site called Jarlshof that will blow your mind. It's got thousands of years of layer upon layer of habitation. I've actually been there before. It's brilliant. And I'm going to make a whole episode about Jarlshof. But first, what I want to do is to take you around the islands to historical gems that I've never seen. Come with. So, after a night at Valley Bed and Breakfast and a great curry, I've driven, I've taken two ferry boats to the Isle of Unst and I've walked and it's all worth it. Because this is what we've come to see. Now, if you're thinking, it's just a ruined dry stain dike, then you're right. But this is a Neolithic dry stain dike. Thousands of years ago, in Neolithic times, farmers here weren't just arriving in dribs and drabs and randomly casting seeds haphazardly across the landscape. No, there was planning, organization, division and demarcation of estates. Dry stain dikes built to parcel out land from the earliest time that farming took hold in these islands. Before the Romans came, in fact thousands of years before Romulus and Remus established Rome and the River Tiber, before Egyptians built the Great Pyramid, Neolithic Shetland farmers built these walls and they're still here today. Isn't that mental? Now the boffins tell me that this division of land suggests that it was because a lot of people arrived in a brief influx that they divided the land this way. A bit like Western powers carving up Africa in the 19th century. Now I find this whole thing astonishing and it's a buzz just to be here. Now, let me show you something else. Back on mainland Shetland is Stainydale Temple. Of course, 
these early farmers didn't just build walls, they built houses as well. And you can find remnants of hundreds of them across the landscape around and about Shetland. They call this Stainydale Temple, but it seems that it's a mistake of early archaeological naming. It's less a temple and more like a great house or feasting or meeting place. It was much bigger than a normal home, with central pillars holding up a roof. This might be a kind of prehistoric village hall. Who knows, maybe it's where the mother and toddlers group met. Maybe the brownies, the cub scouts, bringing by seals, or up here in Shetland, the up hell yeah parties. Now, the Bronze Age brought climactic challenges to Shetland just like other places. Encroachment, a peaty ground, reduction in sustainable farmland. But there were aspects of Shetland that were unique. There was a lack of flint here in these islands. There was also less bronze. So using what was available in the environment meant tools that were uniquely Shetland like Shetland knives and Shetland clubs that you can see in the museum in Lerwick. But that's not the only thing to see in Lerwick. The Iron Age brought a different set of challenges and just 15 minutes walk from the centre of Lerwick is the perfect place to think about them. Defence started to become much more important. People are gathering together more. Now there's a lot of debate about whether it was a social change or larger cohesive groups that brought about defensive needs or defensive needs demanded the move to more communal living. But here at Clickerman seems the perfect place to see it happen. Initially, houses became a bit smaller than they had been. And this is the fortification wall built around those houses for protection at about the time the iron working started. And then sometime later, we have the rise of a broch. Now this site has been tarted up a little and I'm going to make another video about the best preserved broch anywhere and it's just a short boat trip from here. But the point is that during the Iron Age, folks started to build larger multi-storey round towers like communal living spaces. Here, we can see where it followed the clustering of houses and fortified walls. In fact, across Shetland, more than half of the Brock sites have some sort of defensive outer surround. But there were other fortified structures on islands and in promontories as well. It may sound overdramatic, but it seems that the Age of Iron brought fear. Or is there some other explanation as to why farmers made such resource and labour intensive buildings? Maybe somebody was just showing off. But Brochs weren't the end of it. And to show you, I want to take you to yet another incredible site at Old Scatness. As the Iron Age moved into medieval historical period, then early medieval, we saw Rome's influence diminish further south and the influence of the Picts spread north into these islands. Now, in the Scatness brochure, you can see how the houses gradually change back from brochs, first to round wheelhouses like the ones over there, which makes me think of dividing round broch-like formations into smaller cells, almost like taking a large Victorian house and dividing it into flats. You know what these Iron Age slash Pictish property developers were like. Then the fashion changed to houses that had one big room with a smaller room off, maybe for granny. A bit like a figure eight or a fat jelly baby. As the people became Picts, they kept cosy inside their jelly baby houses. Those typical carved Pictish stones arrived here a little later than they did in Scotland proper, as did Christianity. Then, in the late 7th century, came the Vikings. Now, remember we were in Unst to look at a Neolithic dry stone dyke. Dry stone dyke? You know what I mean. 
You can't move in that place without tripping over the remains of Viking settlements. There's even a whole project recreating a Viking house and you should visit that when you go. You see, before the Vikings arrived on mainland Britain, they'd already been here. Pushed by competition for resources in their homelands, they came and they took over the people who'd been here before. The Norse influence is unmistakable as you travel around about the place, from place names to archaeology to culture. But really, I wanted to bring you here. Crossing the narrow causeway beach to St Ninian's Isle, I imagine being sucked down a wormhole in time, traversing from one dimension to another. Now, to be fair, there are so many places in Shetland where I feel like that, but this feels special. Now, the reason I'm heading for St Ninian's Chapel is that it hints at the transition from Christian Pictish to pagan Viking for Shetland. That, plus like so many other places in Shetland, it's just stunningly beautiful. And of course, the sun always shines. Of course, we're not here for sunshine. We're here for history. You see, in 1958, a schoolboy helping out on an archaeological dig on this site found a wooden box beneath the church under a cross-marked slab. The box, which seems to have been hurriedly buried back in the 8th century, was carefully opened. And after centuries in darkness, light once more shone on 28 silver and gilt precious objects that had been hurriedly buried many lifetimes before. Jewellery, weapons, feasting bowls and more. Presumably, at the sight of approaching Vikings, somebody at the chapel had hidden the valuables. We don't know what became of that person who buried the treasure. We do know that they never came back to retrieve it. Shetland was now Norse. And it stayed that way until the 20th of February 1472, which leads us to the old capital of Shetland. Not far from here, the Norse held their assemblies, or tings as they were called. But in 1469, James III of Scotland married Margaret of Denmark. Well, Margaret's daddy was a wee bit strapped for cash. So, in lieu of a dowry, he let James have Orkney in Shetland. It was supposed to be temporary, a bit like pawning a watch. The problem was that at the end of the year, he was still somewhat impecuned. So with a bit of interest added, the debt rolled over to the next year. But the next year was no better. So, long story short, in February 1472, the Scottish Parliament said, they're ours. And the rest, appropriately enough, is history. But Shetland saw some difficult times under the Scottish crown and some of them are still upset about it now. In 1599 the castle here at Scalloway was built by Patrick Stewart. He was proper evil. He was the illegitimate grandson of James V. I don't actually know if he can have an illegitimate grandson. His dad was the illegitimate son of James V, but Patrick was still a bastard. His was a reign of terror and dispossession against the people of Shetland. He was taking lands from the common folk who, remember, were Norse. So by the time the 19th century clearances hit Shetland, they'd already been through clearance hundreds of years before that. So brutal was Patrick Stewart's behaviour to the people of his own fiefdom and so bad was his mismanagement that he was summoned before the Privy Council in 1609 and sent to prison. Now that means you're a badin. While he was in prison in Edinburgh, he got his son to foment rebellion back up here in the Northern Isles, which was none too clever because when the rebellion failed, Patrick was already in prison, and now he was sentenced to death. But because he was so irreligious, he didn't know the Lord's Prayer, so they had to postpone the execution so that he could learn it. Oh. And then they could chop his head off. Let's go to the next place. 
Our last stop's the Croft House Museum, where you can see how they lived in the centuries following. But even under Scottish rule, Shetlanders have seen themselves as being just a little bit different. One of the most famous things about Shetland is the Up Hell Yeah Festival, a Victorian invention which clearly celebrates that Norse part of their heritage. When you travel around, you see Shetland flags rather than saltires. More importantly to the folks who watch this channel, what you'll see is thousands of years of history in a truly unique setting. Whether you take a ferry boat to an island or walk over causeways from Neolithic farm walls all the way through to more recent croft houses, there are more stories than I can tell in one video. Now Promote Shetland paid me to come here and tell you all about this place, but I'll let you in a secret. I would have done it anyway. If you'd like to know more about our island histories, then there's a video coming up on screen now. In the meantime, I'm in Dorcas, going to be a lama alive. Cheerio and drastic.